This week, they're still sucking up our information. They're still acting on our data. Give me the memory sticks. And there are bits and bytes coming out of everything. Welcome to London's Piccadilly Circus, one of the busiest junctions in the city, popular with tourists on the way to the world-famous West End theatres. And that's why the biggest brands pay huge money to advertise on those enormous billboards. But why go big when you can go small? Our mobile devices nowadays know more about us than we do. This almost unrestricted flow of information is a goldmine for advertisers and other groups who want to target us with their messages. Not just about what to buy, but also about what to think, and maybe even how to vote. So, exactly one year ago, new EU legislation came into force. GDPR is designed to stop companies from endlessly collecting and storing our data without us ever knowing. If you live anywhere in Europe, these notices appear to let you know that the website you're looking at is about to collect some data from your device. Delve in and you can choose how your information is shared and collected. Well, that's how it should work anyway. But what's bothered me over the past year is just how complicated some sites make it to switch off the data collection. The option to actually opt out is often obscure. The process of opting out is long and confusing and even then you might not be able to opt out completely without going to lots of other websites and individually opting out there too. I don't think many of us really understand the options and even if we do, come on, how many times could you just not be bothered and pressed accept all anyway? Do you accept cookies or do you want to reject them? What do you generally do? Generally, I would, I would accept them. Um, I accept everything. Sometimes it doesn't make it very clear, not very easy, so yeah, then I just accept. Do you know what you are accepting when you do that? Absolutely no idea. <laughs> hmm, I'm not sure GDPR is working as intended, are you? But the good thing is, this legislation is not just about restricting how our data is collected. It also gives us the power to ask companies what information they hold on us. So that's exactly what Carl Miller set out to try to do. I'm on a battle to get my data back. Hi there, can I make a subject access request under GDPR, please? Yes, to um, exercise my right to be informed about um, all data which is held on me. If you live in the EU, you can use something called a subject access request to ask companies for a copy of your data. All sorts of businesses hold on to our personal information from banks to supermarkets to media organisations. The whole process is supposed to be straightforward. The number on their website doesn't work. There's no email. So now I have an email address. You're supposed to be able to pick your own channel for making these requests. That didn't work. I have to apparently be a member. I'm going to phone them up again because I'm. they may well hold information on me. Um... I'm on day one and I'm already overwhelmed. And these are only the businesses I directly work with. Most people don't realise how companies that you've never heard of have bucket loads of information about you. Every click you make, and even not make, may be recorded and shared. This is the business of personal data. Their job is to scoop up every crumb of information they can get hold of, both from public and private sources, and analyse it to understand me. Or at least try. One company I got my information from had drawn data from hundreds of different sources to create thousands of different guesses about what I'll be like as a consumer. And according to one rating, I'm in the top 10% of an indulgence rank, whatever that means. My consumer electronics audience segmentation is young and struggling, apparently, which is probably more right than wrong. 
It's put me in the top segment of people most likely to gamble online, something I don't think I've ever done. These companies have created a strange digital copy of myself that I don't even recognise, making presumptions I don't necessarily agree with. All the while I've been thinking, I'm getting things for free, so little nuggets of information leaving my life and being collected by others, it doesn't really matter. But now I'm beginning to feel that I'm the product, and it's me that people are getting for free. Frederica Kaltiner is a data and privacy campaigner, and I sat down with her to talk through my concerns. There are two separate kinds of harms. When it's accurate, it's very creepy, and you'd be like, why, why does this company know how much alcohol I consume? But when it isn't, it can be equally concerning. It can be like, maybe you're misclassified as something negative and you aren't, but you're not even aware that the company, like somewhere in some database, someone thinks, thinks you're a gambler and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, it's managed to generate thousands of categories, you know, probably themselves derived from some of the other categories in this data set, you know, all without us actually, like really, like volunteering any of this information ever to yeah. in the first place and really frankly getting no benefit from it. Will I be targeted on the basis of how indulgent I am? Uh, yes. When data brokers offer these categories, they offer them because somebody is demanding them. It's a product that they're selling and all of these categories are categories that marketers, local authorities, whoever they sell data to, want or demand. And all this through my online activity in smartphone. But a lot more data comes from sources we don't even think about. This is my new vacuum cleaner, the robot I have been dreaming of for many years. And like many other smart devices, to operate it, I first have to download its companion app. I just scanned over the terms and conditions because otherwise I'll be here forever. According to one study, it takes 76 days to read all the privacy policies that we come across online. And then the cleaner starts mapping my house. But now I am suspicious and I go to check that it's not hoovering up things that I haven't bargained for. I'm off to Imperial College. Here, researchers have been looking at how Internet of Things devices from child monitoring cameras to light bulbs to smart plugs can collect and share our data. Let's start off with my vacuum cleaner. So we brought the hoover in our lab mm -hmm. and we figure out that the hoover is a little bit more than just a hoover and uh, we analyzed the Wi-Fi data and we saw that the Hoover is sharing the floor maps with some server in China. So your information is not going just to the manufacturer but also some other support services. Based on this privacy policy, um, the company is entitled to share that with third parties if it saw a benefit in doing so. Yeah, of course. And the worst part is that you cannot start without a grid with these policies. And it's not just a vacuum cleaner. This is a monitoring camera that's meant to keep us secure. But in fact, it's sharing data with 54 partner organisations. Collecting data is a common practice for lots of internet-enabled devices. After all, they need it to function properly. But there is very little transparency, so we have no way of knowing how much the device needs itself to work and how much is being given away. Sometimes, with these devices, we notice that there's an inverse relationship between the amount of data that they collect and their price. So cheaper devices, they are financed in a way with your personal data. So they are collecting tons of data about you and sending them to tens of servers across the world. It's really strange how actions that you think are really trivial, switching on a light, switching on a smart plug, changing the volume in your television set, or of course cleaning your floors, can actually be telling so much about you to companies that you are not even aware of. Stop tracking me. <laughs> GDPR says it doesn't matter where the company is based or product is made, you still have the right to your information. But if you don't know who to ask, how can you ask? I spent over a month making requests from 80 companies and around a dozen have replied. So this is what it actually looks like to get your data back. I'm probably 100 emails deep now, and yesterday, by record delivery, this slightly crumpled white envelope turns up at my front doorstep. So thank you very much, GDPR. I've got my data back now. And it is in huge quantities. So if I was to print out all the data which I've currently got, well, this is 1,000 sheets of paper. I would need seven stacks of this if I was to print out all of it. For all its faults, I have no doubt, GDPR is the first step in the right direction. But I fear, ultimately, we, the users, will be the real instigators of change. Until we demand it, we are accepting to carry on living within a system that we know precious little about, 
but it certainly knows a lot about us. That was Carl Miller on a very long journey to get his data back. I'm joined by Ailey Callender, also from the human rights organisation Privacy International. Ailey, welcome. It's really hard to opt out because the instructions are not clear. It's really hard to understand, as Carl found out, the data that the companies do hold on you and it's really hard to find out who has the data on you. It seems to me that companies are deliberately making it too hard for us to opt out. And that's, I mean, that's the key point. You shouldn't be having to opt out. GDPR is very clear that in most circumstances, it's got to be opt in. We haven't really seen them taking a proactive stance to make it easy for people. Um, it's in their interest to get a data and they want to do everything to make that more likely. Do you think realistically it'll actually be us, the consumers, that force these companies to change by voting with our feet? GDPR does provide these provisions to empower individuals but also to empower them to take action so they can get civil society to take action on their behalf but they can also get damages when the, the way that their data has been used has caused them damage and distress. But one really important thing where governments have fallen short is that they haven't fully implemented the provisions that allow civil society to take collective action. And governments also need to look at their own implementation of the law. The law across the EU required extra legislation as well as GDPR to, to implement it. And some countries still haven't done that. And in countries where they have, they've included loopholes, for example, loopholes for political parties, or in the UK, an immigration exemption. And these need to be reviewed and reined in. How can they include loopholes for political parties in light of the Cambridge Analytica and Facebook scandal? Political campaigns, as we know, are becoming more data-driven by the day and using data from a vast variety of, of sources, different types of data about us that we might not know reveal something about our political leanings. And that's why it's really important that data protection authorities, the Electoral Commission and civil society look, look at this issue. What do you think the chances are that the politicians will vote to curtail their chances of winning the next election by stopping their own parties from having access to data? What we've seen is that there is a, a consultation and a code of practice exactly how political campaigns can use our data. There are small steps that individuals can take, but it is, as you say, difficult. Things like minimising the targeted ads you see by looking at the privacy settings on the different platforms you've used, and Privacy International's made guides on how to do this in the different platforms. You can uh, ask uh, different actors for your data, as you know, and use your, your data rights. You can question political parties about the use of their data. Ailey, thanks so much for your time. Thanks very much. Hello and welcome to the week in tech. It was the week that lawmakers in the US proposed a bill to make texting while crossing the street illegal. Under the proposed law, transgressors in New York could be fined between $25 and $250. Meanwhile in the UK, police in South Wales faced a legal challenge over the use of facial recognition on privacy grounds. Controversy around Chinese tech firm Huawei continues to grow. Google restricted access to its Android operating system after the US government added Huawei to a list of companies that American firms cannot trade with without a license. Uncertainty over the company's phones led to UK networks Vodafone and EE to stop selling Huawei handsets. And the US government has issued an alert warning that Chinese-made drones could pose a cyber espionage risk to American businesses and other organisations. Though the warning does not refer to a specific company, it's said that those using the drones for tasks related to national security or critical infrastructure were most at risk. Photo sharing site Instagram says it's trying to find out how contact details of almost 50 million of its users were stored online in an unguarded database. Facebook, which owns the service, said the leak was traced to a Mumbai-based company and was investigated. A report by the United Nations has claimed that female voice assistants are fueling damaging gender stereotypes. Titled I'd Blush If I Could, the report calls on companies to make devices such as the Amazon Echo and Google Home sound gender neutral. We're on our way to an experience that hopes to make us think about how our data is being used. 
We've been instructed to go to a pub near London Bridge where we're delivered a message. We need you, Sarah needs you. Keep your phone to hand and await further instructions. Josh. I've got a text message. Meet me here in five minutes under the green leafy hut thing. Recollection is a piece of immersive theatre that uses your data, the same sort of information advertisers easily get their hands on, to take you on a somewhat uncomfortable journey. OK, stay close, let's move. Stay close. Are you Sarah? Yes. Do you know Josh? Yes. We're told about a secret mind-shifting experience where we give up our memories memory deletion basically and you don't remember because it's a procedure you all had done this is the first step towards me piecing my mind back together i went behind the scenes with one of the creators to learn what is actually going on here we get sent uh, their name and email from our ticketing provider we can run an enrichment a data enrichment on that person it will start to pull out things like related people um, things like uh, any social media accounts so we've got my twitter in here my personal email address my github you know just anything that could be relevant even if we don't exactly know how it's relevant from that point we can then start curating the imagery that makes sense within the show i'm looking for the dossier they collated on you as the show unfolds, tension builds until the big reveal. The dossier on you, concocted from your online life. And I have no idea what we're going to find in these files. What is this? Wow! Wow, my old boss from years ago. I'm really careful about not putting anything personal online, yet still what they found surprised me. Is this really the sort of information that companies would be holding on there? Uh, sort of. There's a couple of things going on here. The first is that we're a theatre company, not a sales organisation or marketing organisation. So while we have access to the same types of stuff, we're going to use things differently. My first thought was that if you put my name into a search engine, you would find far more relevant and meaningful information than the pictures that are here. That's true, but at the same time, you would also kind of know where that came from and it would lose a little bit of mystery uh, when it comes to the storyline of recollection, which is about uh, memories that you've intentionally had removed from your past. Take the memory stick out, delete the information in the cells. Memory stick out, yeah. log out, information in the cells, get rid of it all. So the things that I don't recognise in these images, the people or the places, they are deliberately there as things I don't know and it gives you a bit of leeway as well? Uh, yeah, they might be deliberately there. Um, also, when we find imagery and stuff that's relevant to you, we don't really know how it's relevant to you and, in fact, if it is at all. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> ooh. OK, everybody out. Now, you need to go. Okay. Go. Why did you want to put people's data center stage? Um, as a company, the idea of taking the customized experience that people get online and giving them an offline experience that's just as, as tailored to them is something that we're interested in doing, and that's what our platform does. As far as recollection goes, GDPR was a year ago. Still nobody understands what it is, even people that are in the technology world. And we just try to you know, use our position as a blend of a, a theater company, a technology company, to demystify it a little bit for people. Give me the memory sticks. Because if I don't have them, then he will. Oh. 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 It's been a pretty intense experience. But the thing that it's really left me with is I want to hold on to my data. The show has really stuck with me, yet a few weeks on, has my behaviour changed? Of course not, I really want my online life to be easy, so I'm still handing over my data left, right and centre, but maybe I'm just yet to be struck by what that means in the real world. And that's the problem, isn't it? If it makes it easier to use, we will continue to give our data away, won't we? I mean. In all honesty, I don't know how to stay private and use technology in a meaningful way. Now, did you know that there are a whole host of FX artists working across Instagram, of all places? Well, we went to visit one in Modena in Italy, home of balsamic vinegar and Ferrari, amongst others, to find out why. My name is Simone Vezzani. I'm a 3D artist based in Italy, and I publish uh, content for social media. If 
somebody think that what I do is real for me, this means that I, I did a good job. I choose Instagram because it's full of people that they are just watching and get uh, amazed on what they see. I don't want to set the world on fire. I start to record footage about my, my own life, my uh, travel, my trip, my visit, museum visit, for example and I start to mix them with uh, digital content. <laughs> Platform for this kind of content, Instagram, was perfect because people are not used to see and to watch this kind of uh, media content in this platform. When I was younger, I was really obsessed about video games. Suddenly, I grew up and I realized that for a living, I have to work somehow. I find this kind of software. And this software, 3D software in particular, for me, are uh, another way to see these video games. Because inside this kind of software, I, ca I can manipulate and I create everything I want. The most important things in this kind of work is the lightning and of course the model and the texture and the shade you, you create but if the light inside the effect, inside the 3D scene doesn't match and doesn't fit perfectly with the real world, uh, the result will be fake. Uh, the best thing is uh, when I for example create my content, I shoot the video, I create the video and after that I stop the record and I take a 360 panoramic shoot from the area because in, uh, in that way I have the source of light and I have something like a dome uh, where I can put inside my scene and in this way the light is exactly the, the same as the real world. I usually spend something like uh, one two, maybe three weeks working on one single video because I'm alone and I'm, I have to take care of every single aspect. I don't consider myself as an artist. I'm really happy when someone told me that I'm an artist, I'm a surrealist or something like that. But I'm simply a guy who likes to play with computer and experiment and new technique, new styles, new, new way to see the world. The rather talented Simona Vizzani finishing off this week's Click. Don't forget that we live on social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube and Twitter at BBC Click. If you'd like to hear from us throughout the week or get in touch, that's how you do it. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.